Well, good morning, Rutherford County and all those who may be listening in this morning. We're grateful you've tuned in with us this morning, and we're grateful to come be, be able to have the opportunity to come and open our heart and share with you all the things that God is doing at Word of Faith. I'm Jessica Farmer, and I've come to you this morning with a message of hope. What God's laid on my heart and begun to t- teach me how to walk in is a message of hope. And it's good that we can have hope in our Savior. It's good that we have something that we can look forward to and that we have, we have hope for a brighter tomorrow. And I wanted to start this morning in Matthew. I want to speak to you this morning about the grace of God. And I've heard about the grace of God all my life. And and I came to North Carolina and to my church when I was about nine years old. And I remember before that time, I would hear, you know, the ministers preach about the grace of God. And it was always, you know, the saving grace. And there was many places in my life I didn't understand what that even meant or how to walk in that. And one thing that I've been taught at our church is the Word of God is real. And and our pastors, Sam and Jane, have taught us how to let God speak from His Word so that you can walk and you can live in His Word every day. It can be real to you. And that's what God began to speak to me in the grace of God. It began to be real to me. I mean, the Word of God, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, is powerful. It, it's it's powerful in our lives and just by virtue of the fact that God said it or that Jesus said it is is enough for us to know that we can walk in it and a scripture that's very close to my heart is in Matthew 11 and in verse 28 Jesus says come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and and overburdened and I will cause you to rest I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. And that's good news this morning. And we can believe it. Jesus said it and we can believe that. He says in 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus said, I am gentle and meek and humble and lowly in heart. And you will find rest, relief relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. For my yoke is wholesome useful, good, not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing, but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be borne. And I'm sure this is a familiar scripture to some of you. And there may be a few more words in there than you're used to. And that's because I'm reading this morning out of the Amplified Bible. And the, some of the Hebrew and Greek meanings are in the Amplified Bible in these scriptures. And I love it where it says, if you're heavy laden, if you're overburdened, Jesus said, I will cause you to rest. I love it where it says that his burden is not hard. It's not sharp or pressing, but it's comfortable and it's gracious. And recently, God has been putting it on my heart to study about the grace of God because I begin to see the little pressures in life that come at us every single day like the winds of a storm Jesus is greater than those and when you look at Jesus's life he walked through unbelievable opposition on this earth he walked through many things that were difficult his family turning on him or you know death around him but he walked through just like this scripture says He says his burden is not pressing, but it's comfortable and it's gracious. But how do we walk there? Well, it says clearly here, Jesus says, come to me. And that is as simple as Jesus, please help me in whatever circumstance you're walking through, whether it's, you know, you have so much to do with the house, you know, the laundry's, you know, ready to be done. The children are ready to go out the door, the, or whether it's, life's big situations your mom's sick or you know we tend to turn to Jesus in those situations those of us that have seen the hand of God or heard about the hand of God in our life we tend to turn to Jesus in those situations those big things that we would consider big things in life but to God it says in Job nothing is trivial and Jesus wants to help us in every area of our life and all he's waiting on For his grace to come to us is for us to turn to him and say, help me, Jesus. 
Help me through this. Give me the wisdom. Give me the grace. I know this is your will for my life and I just want to do it in your I just want to do it in your grace. And knowing that his burden is comfortable, that it's easy and that it's light. But what is the grace of God? What even is it? In in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 Paul tells us, laboring together as God's fellow workers with him then, I beg of you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Well, it tells us in the Amplified Bible what that is. It's that merciful kindness by which God exerts his holy influence on our souls and tur- excuse me, turns them to Christ, keeping them and strengthening our souls Do not receive it, Paul says, to no purpose. And the New Amplified Bible, it tells us that 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 means you you receive it to no purpose by turning away from the sound doctrine. Now that's very important. It was very important and it really stuck out to me that it said that God's grace is his holy influence on souls and it turns them to Christ. And we can believe that. We can believe that if we turn to Jesus in any situation he's going to come and influence our souls and he's going to turn us to Christ he's going to be our Lord he's going to be our Savior he cares about every single need we have and he wants to help us and he wants to influence us and when you it's so good that God what God's given us and the tools that God's given us if you have an area in your life that you know you're not pleasing to Jesus or it just doesn't seem right or you don't understand you have questions you can go to this scripture and many times I'll just sit before this Bible and I'll just say Jesus what do you want to speak to me and over and over again God just opens the book and it just unfolds what he wants to speak to you Or I'll get my concordance out. And Jesus, like he did recently, will put it in my heart to study on the grace of God. And you'll open that concordance and go through the scriptures. And on the side, it'll tell you different numbers that you can look up in the back. And you can look up what those words mean in the Greek, if it's in the New Testament, and the Hebrew, if it's in the Old Testament. And it gives so much understanding as to what you're reading. And when I looked up the, the word grace in, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it's the Greek word charis. And it means, like it said in the Amplified Bible, divine influence on our hearts and its reflection in our lives. And that's what we want. And so, you know, it's in our hearts. We want the reflection, Jesus to be reflected in our lives not just in the big situations, but in everything we do and everything we say. Because the Bible does tell us that we will be stand before God on Judgment Day. And He will open the books. And He will judge us for every idle word, for every attitude of the heart. And it tells us over and over again in the scriptures, get rid of bad feeling towards others. Get rid of malice. Get rid of these things. And please Jesus don't do anything that doesn't please Jesus but how do we do that what is that easy yoke and that easy burden that's in our lives and it's so clear in Ephesians chapter 2 and I wanted to read you several scriptures from that it says in verse 1 and you he made alive when you were dead slain by your trespasses and sin and that's the only thing that sin will do for us The Bible says the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's all he can do. All he can do, all he has is lies. There's no truth in him, the Bible says. But it says here that Jesus made us alive in that. He made us alive even when we were dead. How did he do that? He he God sent his son to die on the cross. And it's so real what Jesus did on that cross. He took away every bit of sin that you or I could ever be faced with. He took it upon himself. And what that means is if we do what he said in Matthew and we come to him and we cry out to him every day, he'll take it away from us. And I I tell things in my life now, things that happened to me in the past, things that I used to think, things that way the way I used to be. And it's like I'm telling about somebody else. 
I'm telling about somebody else's life because it feels so distant from me. And that's how it feels when God washes you. And he, he takes that away. And there's no peace on this earth like a clean conscience. When you know your sins, you've come to Jesus, you've told it all, you've borne your heart to him, and through the, through the delivering power of his blood, he's washed your sins away. And that's available to anybody on the face of this earth. And it says in verse 2, at which in one time you, you once walked habitually. I mean, there's things that we walk in habitually. And there are habits in our lives. And we say, I'm never going to do that again. And you turn around and you find yourself doing it again. What Jesus said, he came to you at then. And he said, you were following the course and the fashion of this world. You were under the sway and the tendency of this present age. You were following the prince of the air. Who's that? Satan. He's our personal enemy. And that's the way our lives were. We were following him. Whatever he said, we did. You were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirits that still are constantly work at work on the sins of disobedience, which are the careless, the rebellious, and the unbelieving. They are those that go against the purposes of God. You walked and lived and conducted yourselves. Um, you were obeying the impulses of the flesh, it says in verse 3. But in verse 4 it says, But God, so rich is he in his mercy, because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love which we, he has for us. You have to believe that today. You have to believe that Jesus loves each and every one of you. Your life will change if you believe that. Your life will change if you believe that just because of you, and the pit that you may be in and the sorrow that you may be feeling, God sent his son to deliver you from it. He, he says his love is so intense and so rich that he had to satisfy it. Even when we were dead in our shortcomings, he made us alive together in fellowship. How did he do it? He made us alive in union with Christ. When we come to Jesus, we begin to become one with Jesus. We walk with him. We talk with him. We learn of him, as it says in Matthew 11. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. And God has given us the very life of Christ as an example to us. And for us to appropriate in our own lives for the redemption for our sin. The same new life with which he quickened. It is by grace and it says here, God's favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, none of us did, that you were saved. You were delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. You know, it says in the book of Psalms, Lord, if you marked our transgressions, who would be able to stand? None of us would. But it, we didn't deserve God's grace. But through the death of Jesus and hit the work of the cross that he did in our lives, we we're brought into a place of favor and undeserved favor and mercy in our lives. But that is available to us each and every day, each and every moment of each and every day that we just turn to him. And you walk through something and you realize God's grace is right beside you. He's with you. You didn't feel the sting of that death or you didn't feel the the pang of that, those harsh words that your brother spoke to you. You didn't feel it this time because you went to Jesus and you cried out to him and he was with you. He was your source. He raised us up together in verse 6 it said, with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with Jesus in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Jesus Christ and that's how we are in Jesus Christ. You know, in, in, in John 15, it says, you know, you're abiding in me and I'm abiding in you if my word remains and lives in you. If you ask God to put his word in your heart and you ask God, you ask Jesus to quicken it to you. When I go to speak something out of my mouth, it's not by the spirit of God. I pray this all the time. Jesus quickened to me that that's not of you. It didn't come from you and I don't want it. And it's God's grace immediately when you pray that prayer with a sincere heart. It's God's grace that comes forward to your rescue. And he says he did it. He, God did this in, that he might clearly demonstrate th 
through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace. And again, the Amplified Bible defines that as his undeserved favor. It's limitless. That means no matter what you go through, that means no matter what someone does to you, God's grace is more. God's grace is sufficient. For it's by free grace, verse 8 says, that God's unmerited favor, that you were saved, you were delivered from judgment. Each one of us deserved God's judgment because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of, of walking closely with Jesus every second of every day and doing his will and doing the call of God on our life. And this salvation is not of your own selves of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is a free gift of God. We have to believe that. There's nothing you or I can do to change ourselves. There's nothing you can pull yourselves up by the bootstraps and say, I'm not doing that again. I see what that did, or I'm not going to that person, that place again, or I'm not doing this. You, there's nothing in, you have no power. We've, I've, I've learned that in my life. I have no power to stop sinning in and of myself. The only power that we have is the grace of God that flows through us when we go to Jesus. And it says it's immeasurable. It's limitless. It's surpassing all of our expectations. It's not by works we've done, verse 9 says. And in verse 10, let this sink into your heart. It says, we are God's own handiwork. His workmanship. God is working on us every day. There are circumstances that you may face today that you have no idea, but just know that God's there for you. He's ready to work in your heart and bring you through those circumstances when it looks like there's no way, when it looks like there's no hope. He's there for you. We are his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus through the new birth, through being truly born again. When you come to that place of total surrender, there's nothing you want to serve him, to do his will for your life. When you come to that place of being truly born again, he comes in your life and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you and he speaks to you who Jesus is, what his will is for your life, what his will is not for your life. That is being recreated in Jesus Christ. Born anew. We were born on this earth to be born again. Our pastors have taught us that so many times. That we may do those good works. God has good works for you to do today. And it's not for you to do, but for you to surrender, obey, and let him flow through you. It's so easy. It's just like Jesus said. His burden is so light and so easy. He predestined, he planned beforehand in his love. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us, see where I am here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us, Paul tells us a situation that he walked through. And many of us can relate to this. We have things in our lives that just won't go away. It just won't change in our mind's eye. And Paul tells us, he start, I'll start in verse 7 of chapter 12. And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by exceeding greatness and preeminence of these revelations. Indeed, God spoke great revelations to Paul. He was one that persecuted the church beyond anyone else. He, he did more, he says, to, to sin against the church. And God met him on the road on his way to Damascus to further damage and abuse the church. God, Jesus met him face to face. And he, and he said to him, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the goads? It will not turn out good for you. And we know that Paul surrendered his life that day. And, and he said to Jesus, what do you want me to do? And that's what every one of us need to say. What is it you want me to do? And I'll tell you from experience, God will speak to you. Jesus will come with his word if you ask him out of a true heart. And so God did give him great revelation. God sent him to the Gentiles, whereas the apostles had been going to, you know, God's chosen people, the Jews. And God sent him to the Gentiles with revelation to bring them out of the old dead letter of the law, which so many of us have lived under. All you know is 
these are the do's, these are the don'ts. And, you know, thank God for it. So even in my own life, I see that that kept me from, you know, doing so many things that would have damaged my life. Going out and giving you so much sin because I knew God said not to do it. Because I really wanted to please Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus. Not at, that, not at those points in my life. But the law guarded me. But Paul came with a message that brought people unto Jesus. Brought people unto that Matthew 11, that easy yoke. That surrender and that submission, it's so easy just to sit still one second and let Jesus speak through you and let him work through you. And he's there for you. So that's what he means when he says to keep me from being so puffed up in the great revelations. He says, there was given to me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack and buffet and harass me, to keep me from being exceedingly exalted. And three times I called upon the Lord and besought him about this and begged that it might depart from me. Well, I've prayed and it didn't change. Well, I don't, I don't understand why God wouldn't let this happen. I mean, we don't want to sound like that because then God cannot work on our behalf. There are things that we don't understand. There are things that, you know, God says my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. They're higher than your thoughts. There are things that I walked through even for years in my life that I didn't understand at the time. But I couldn't give any amount of money for walking through them because I learned Jesus. I learned I couldn't do it myself. I couldn't do it on my own. And maybe three times we've inquired and besought and begged God that it would depart from us. But what did God say to him? That's what's important. He said to me, my grace, my favor, my loving kindness, and my mercy is enough for you. Well, what does that mean? It says it's sufficient, sufficient, it, the Amplified Bible says, against any danger and it enables you to bear the trouble manfully. It enables you to bear the trouble at all. There's so many things, you know, that you may have walked through that you think, I can't handle this. I can't go through this again. I can't do this again. But just remember that Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient. It's enough for you against any danger and it enables you, it empowers you to walk through your situations. For my strength and power, and this is what I want you to really get today. This is what God's really been speaking to me. My, great, my strength and my power are made perfect, fulfilled, and complete, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Now, what has been put in us all our lives? You can do it. Try, try, try again. If at first you don't succeed, try again. I think I can. I think I can. The little engine set up that hill. Remember those things that have been put in you all your life? Be all you can be. Well, what is, how does God think about that? It's quite the opposite. My strength and my power, he says, are made perfect, fulfilled, and complete and show themselves most effective in your weakness. You know, in our own lives, we run from weakness. We run from those things that may, may show our weakness or our vulnerability or our... Oh. But Jesus said, come to me. Remember in Matthew 7, he said, come to me. And in, my, in your weakness, my strength and my power is made most effective. In so many situations in my life, God has taught me just that. I can't do anything. And really, if you want to know the truth of the matter of it, there's no good and perfect gift that comes down except that it comes from the Father above. There's no good in us except God put it there. And in our weakness, in our surrender, in our inability to do anything, if you know that, I mean, Paul says in another place, I have, I have resolved to know nothing. Now, so many of us think, well, I know how to get up and go to work. I know how to brush my teeth. Well, what does he mean? I've resolved to cry out to Jesus on every matter and situation in my life. And in my weakness, his power and strength is made most effective. So, 
He says, therefore, I will all the more glo gladly glory in my weakness and infirmity, that the strength and the power of Christ may rest. Yes, God's grace may rest, pitch its tent over me, and dwell upon me. And that's good news. I mean, so many times God comes through for you and he miraculously moves. And then that devil's there to say, well, he did it this month and he paid your bills this month. But I don't know about this month. No, his grace is going to pitch a tent over us and he's ready to help us with every need we have. So for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased, Paul said, and I take pleasure in my infirmities, my hardships, persecutions. We've learned to do that. Perplexities, distresses. For when I'm weak in human strength, then I'm truly strong. I'm able and powered in divine strength. And that's what we want in our lives today. We want to be empowered in divine strength. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 12, it says that the grace of God, verse 11, I'll start in verse 11, the grace of God, His unmerited favor and His blessing, any blessing that God puts in our lives, it's His grace upon us. It's Him through Jesus trying to show us how much He loves us. And we would do well to acknowledge each and every one of them every day. Jesus, thank you. I mean, that I have a roof over my head, that I have a breath, that I have breath in my lungs, that, that, that you've brought me through this and you've brought me through that. It brings you closer to Jesus to remember those things that God's brought you through and to be grateful. And one of the definitions... I don't know if I read it or not, of the word charis or grace, was that, it, that, that it's thankworthy. And it is. The, the things that God, the things that God have done, has done for us are thankworthy. They're worthy of thanks. But it says, His divine blessing, His unmerited favor has come forward. It's appeared. Believe that today. It's appeared for you. It has come forward for you. For the deliverance from sin if you mix your faith with that, God will teach you how to come out of whatever it is that plagues you. I mean, in different places in the Amplified Bible, it calls those things agitating passions. I mean, they are after us every day, the devil is. Because you have a call of God on your life. And that's what we've been taught at my church. God put each and every one of us on this earth for a reason. And the devil does not like it. He is mad when we turn our heart to, to Jesus because he knows that we're going to make it to heaven if we walk with Jesus. But the grace of God has come forward. Today's the day of salvation. Just believe. The grace of God's come forward for me today. For the deliverance of sin. And for the eternal salvation for all mankind. That leaves every one of us without excuse. And it says in verse 12 that the grace of God has trained us. And I love that. I love that. When, when Jesus told us in Matthew 11 to come to me. It says learn of me. It says the grace of God will train you. It says it's trained us to reject and renounce all ungodliness. Even ungodliness, godliness, we don't even know what it is. He's training us to, to reject it all. Every bit of it. Every irreligion and worldly passionate desires to live. The grace of God has trained us to live discreet and temperate and self-controlled lives. Upright, devout, spiritually whole lives in this present world while we await and look for the fulfillment and the realization of our blessed hope. What's our hope? We know Jesus is coming. We know he said in John that he's gone away to prepare a place for us and that he sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and that if we obey him and if we obey his word and we keep his word in our heart to obey it, then he'll pitch a tent in us. He'll pitch a tent over us. We just read it. We are looking forward for our blessed hope, even this glorious appearing of our great and great God and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, who gave himself on our behalf that he might redeem us, purchased our freedom from all iniquity, that he might purify for himself a people to be peculiar, peculiarly his own. People who are eager and enthusiastic about living a life that is good and filled with beneficial deeds. That's what we want to do. We want to allow the grace of God. It's just like it makes it easy. When you turn to Jesus, it's just like it makes it easy. 
Remember that today. Remember that Jesus is there for you. We love you. We pray for you at the Word of Faith. Have a good day.